Hi there, this is McKenna Canty. I'm a senior at UMass Amherst and an intern with the New Music Alliance, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping the careers of Western New England artists who write original music. You're about to hear my interview with Peter J. Newland, a talented musician and songwriter and the leader of the bands Fat and Radio X. Hi there, Peter. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. So, um, the song Shape I'm In, which many of our listeners have just heard, uh, is considered one of your band's fat, best, and most popular songs. Could you tell me maybe a little bit about the the process of writing that song and the album Fat? Sure. So, I um, I was at Holy Community College uh, back in late 67, 68. Mm -hmm. I met a... um, Couple guys from Southwick, and we put a bit, put the band together. Eventually, came up with the name Fat, and everybody was around here was doing cover material back then. And I remember very early on, I had been writing uh, as a folk singer. I remember very early on, you know, um, sort of championing the idea to these guys that we needed to write our own music. And Jim Kaminsky had come up with that chord progression on a guitar and I and I think that was the first song that we wrote we every we wrote almost everything in fact I we wrote together as a band and uh or I wrote with the guitar players they wrote the music and I wrote the lyrics and the melody and mm-hmm. um and so that's how that happened he was playing this well, it was not a riff really it was just a chord progression and I um, you know had some words that I put to it and that that was the start it was our first, I guess the other thing I would say, it was our first single. It was on the air, and we decided we didn't like it, so we were not playing it <laughs> on our shows. And I I remember arguing, you know, some of the dumb things you do when you're young and in the business, arguing with my producer about, well, we're, we've, we've grown beyond that we've artistically, and he's going, but dude, it's on the radio. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I love that. I've grown to, to love that song very much. Mm-hmm. That's so cool that that's the first song you guys wrote, and it just happened to be the single. Like that's that's so cool. Kind of started right. off on a good note, definitely. And um, speaking of songwriting, you've had a long career as a songwriter. Uh, are there topics you enjoy writing about the most, and do you write songs that are kind of connected to personal experience, more broader themes, or combo? You know? Yeah, I you know I really am kind of like I look upon myself kind of like as a radio. You know, and if I'm tuned in right, then the, um, you know, a thought, um, a phrase, a word phrase, a lot of times the lyric comes first for me, Mm -hmm. presents itself. And a lot of my writing process kind of happens in a way unconsciously. And that's Mm -hmm. a song. I'm not a guy that sits down with a pad and a piece of paper and goes, I'm going to write a song. It's sort of, um, I've had songs that almost came out whole and it was more, for me, it's more of um, you know being present in in my in my space in my mind and soul space, and then um, it's sort of a magical thing. A lot of times, big pieces big mm-hmm. pieces of it come through in chunks, and then I really have to. The hard work is fine tuning those and connecting them together. Mm-hmm. The other yeah, thing that I had, I had a lot of political content on my first record, mm-hmm. and I made a decision early on. I still uh, try to um, keep a lot of social consciousness and community activity involved in my music, whether my performing or my writing, but I would rather weave it into the tapestry in a holistic way as opposed to being a topical writer. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard that before, having songwriters. It's kind of, it's like it's written before and then it just kind of comes to you. So I right. Love that. And I, uh, speaking of community, I understand you're put it, putting together a project that centers around a new song you've written called Lean on Me, Stand By You, that will raise money and give thanks to first responders working during the pandemic. Could you tell me a little bit about that project? Yeah, since the beginning of the pandemic, I, um, you know, I've been just for some reason, you know, really aware of the first, the frontline workers, the nurses, the doctors, the you know, the staff in the hospitals, the people that are stepping in, you know, to into danger every day and working incredibly long hours 
and in a redefined um, sort of job description, you know, some of these people are, the nature of this disease is that they're the last connection that people have before they die. I can't, I can't imagine that emotional strain and yeah. stress and burden. And, you know, I was, com- you, I was uh, quite aware of it in the beginning. And then as I see this mm-hmm. thing resurge and we're, we're still going to be going through several more months, I really wonder how these people are dealing with that. And, and, and uh, one of the, one of the things that I see a lot of on, on TV when I'm watching the news and that sort of thing is there's a lot of blogs and a lot of, video clips of these people talking about their work and being, and it's really, I see some really raw footage of people in mm-hmm. tears and just people mm-hmm. really past their their limits. And so I thought one thing I could try to do would be just to say thank you, especially during a, th- a time when the, the there there are these, you know, viral news events of epic status that happen at a breathtaking pace and in spite of the gravity of the COVID-19 situation and the situation that the workers are in, a lot of times it's obscured and people don't even talk about it. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, uh, so I wrote a song once again I hadn't intended to be mm-hmm. about the pandemic, and it turned out that way. And I'm, and I'm going to launch it in the next, uh, I would say, two weeks, in, along with a call to action to just ask people to do a you know, little video, a little, little selfie, you know, with a sign or do a dance or, you know, some of the silly things that we all do anyway because we're on our phones mm-hmm. all day long to say thank you to the uh, to the frontline workers. I, and I think that that would that would just, I think it's it's needed and I think it's something everybody can do. It's easy to do. It's and we're on the phones anyway, and mm-hmm. uh, I think it would mean a great deal to them. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's a video. Wow, because I feel like that's such a just a great way to connect especially when we're all apart right now so that's such right. a great idea i'm looking forward right. to seeing it right so we're going to launch that um song and mm-hmm. video and i have a full-length video of that i'm mm-hmm. going to launch that probably in the next two to three weeks and i'll probably do it amongst other things off of my facebook page so cool we'll make sure to keep an eye out for it definitely you're listening to an interview with peter j newland the leader of the band's Fat and Radio X. Yeah, so your band Fat has been able to open for many well-known bands and artists. Uh, I was wondering if you had one tour that you maybe enjoyed the most. Well, I, you know, I, I had the. We didn't tour a lot, but we played mm-hmm. a lot of gigs. Yeah. And and being here, I've had the great opportunity to play with my heroes. The blues greats. So I played with Buddy Waters. I played with Freddie King. Mm-hmm. I played with Junior Wells. We played with um, Sonny Terry and Brown and McGee. You know, um, but I think that the, we had a series of shows with the Allman Brothers in their very first tour mm-hmm. that were very meaningful to us. We had we were sitting home on a weekend with with no gig, and uh, there was a place called the Woodrose Ballroom up on uh, Route Five and Ten in Deerfield, and I knew the guy that owned it. Well, he he was booking the place, and he called and said, "I got these guys, the Allman Brothers." We go, "Who are they?" Because nobody had heard of them. <laughs> yeah. And we went up and played two dates with them up at in South Deerfield, and obviously, you know, we were just amazed at the at the music they were creating. Of course, this is when Greg and 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 Barry uh, were still in the band, and then the people came from UMass to obviously to hear that because it's just a 10 minute 50 minute drive and they mm-hmm. loved it so much that they brought the whole bill down to to UMass so we did a a show with the Allman Brothers at UMass and they're from Georgia so we had their first uh, north south snowball fight uh with, <laughs> with the Allman Brothers and we remained friends you know from there on we we went to see them when they were at the Fillmore and when and interestingly enough when we were recording our last record down at Criteria Studios in Florida um, which was well after Dwayne and Barry were gone. Um, they were recording at the same time, so we got a chance to connect with them down there as well. That's so cool. Oh, I can't imagine having a snowball fight with the Allman Brothers. That's awesome. <laughs> it's it was so a lot funny. of fun. We won. Of course, we yes, were better yeah. at it. <laughs> Represent the North. There you go. Right. 
Um, would you say that maybe was your single most exciting live performance, or are there any others that stand out? In, like, well, we played a really big festival up in uh, Mossport, Ontario, called Strawberry Fields Festival. So that was. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, you know, and then then once again, I mean, to share the stage with Freddie King and, and Muddy Waters, mm -hmm. there's there's so many of them, and that that's that's what I consider to be my great treasure from. Um, you know, from my years in the business or those opportunities to be, you know, to, to speak, to get to know, to talk to, to play alongside my, my heroes, you know. Mm -hmm. That's so cool, yeah. Yeah, performing is definitely a pretty magical experience, I can imagine. And um, speaking of the uh, the business, I know you started the music industry in the late 60s and you signed with RCA and then Atlantic in the 70s. So I, I can imagine that a lot has changed, especially with music that is all shared digitally now. Um, I don't know if maybe have you noticed a difference in how labels are run? Or <coughs> well, videos? yeah, that's a long conversation, but Napster, yeah. you know, file sharing blew that up. Yeah. And so, um, you know, to me, it's just a whole different animal out there now. And I'm still, you know, grappling with that. I did take a hiatus of a sort. I kept always kept playing but I had to take a little trip into corporate America to try to put together some stability mm -hmm. for my for my later years. But I'm back in the business. I spent 12 years in Nashville writing in in the publishing mm -hmm. business. And um and, and that's my main contact now. So there's some amazing things I mean, I'm doing some recording now with some high-level people that I met in Nashville and the fact that we can do it all remotely. And the quality of mm -hmm. uh, of the recording sessions um, is pretty amazing. The more difficult thing to for me to try to navigate, in spite of the fact that I've always been a fan of the of the industry and the politics and the and the uh, infrastructure, sort of in the gears of the industry, is how uh, you know how exactly. Um, you disseminate, you know, once you once you have your songs in that, you know, what are the and it changes on almost a mm -hmm. weekly basis. But what are the ways that you, what are the ways that now that the business has morphed from from CDs and things you can hold in your hand into digital content and into, into streaming and from labels? I mean, the labels, the major labels got broken down into smaller niche labels. You know, mm -hmm. what are the what are the best ways to navigate that? that um that process you know so it's it's mm -hmm. it remains a challenge but yeah. um it's something that I love and I and I realized halfway through my experience I realized as I was doing a recording session and was actually laying down a vocal and I said that there are things that are going on that have nothing to do with how good this song is and how well I'm singing it that have everything to do with whether it's ever going to get heard by anybody mm -hmm. and so uh, one of the things that I do now is work with younger people and you know, and they teach me kind of what's going on with the business now, and I uh, find that oftentimes I have things that I've learned through my experience uh, that are of value to them, and that's one way that I keep in touch. Cool. That's awesome, like giving back and learning at the same time. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, those are all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for talking to me. This is great. Okay, McKenna. Thank you so much for calling. You just heard an interview with Peter J. Newland, the leader of the bands Fat and Radio X. This is McKenna Canty signing off for the New Music Alliance, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping the careers of Western New England artists who write original music.